Carol Fagali Boswick was recruited to the Medical University, <coughs> excuse me, of South University's uh, South Carolina's Division of Rheumatology and Immunology in 2013 as the Smart State and Kitty Task Holt Endowed Chair and Professor of Medicine. I'd like to see that on a business card. <laughs> She earned her PhD in microbiology and immunology at Tulane. She leads a team of clinical and basic scientists whose goal is to identify novel tar targets for therapy for scleroderma and other fibrosing conditions. She's also a very generous mentor of young physician and academic scientists. She will close this conference with a look back at the last 25 years of progress in scleroderma, as well as a look ahead as we get one step closer to a cure. She serves as vice chair of the board of directors for the National Square Derma Foundation and is also chair of the research committee and liaison to the medical and scientific advisory committee. In 2013, she was recognized as a messenger of hope by her peers and colleagues in the Square Derma community for her positive attitude and spirit, which exemplifies hope for all people living with Square Derma. It's quite possible that Carol has spoken at every chapter and maybe in every state on behalf of the foundation. We are very grateful for her passion and dedication and her leadership commitment to the foundation for these many years. Personally, I have had the honor and it's been a privilege to serve with Carol on the National Board of Directors. Uh, equally important, she has become a very dear friend of my wife Ronnie and mine and, to the, and it's of specific importance to the scleroderma community at large. She is truly our beacon of hope. Carol. That was such a generous introduction, thank you. Good morning everyone, those with you, those of you who are here with us, those who are joining us virtually, it's been an incredible weekend. I don't know how you all feel, but it feels so good to be in our scleroderma tribe, right? This is your tribe, this is where you belong. I hope we're ending the weekend and you are feeling encouraged, empowered, energized. I certainly feel this way. I hope that you've made new friends, new connections, expanded your support network, and that you are leaving with a lot of hope because there are a lot of reasons for us to be hopeful. So I was tasked with looking back at the past 25 years of research. So I hope none of you made plans for the next month, because we're going to be in here that long to cover that many years. No, I wouldn't do that to you. So we're going to take a big uh, view, basically overall view, of some of the major changes that have happened op over the past 25 years. Um, I'm going to try and make it not too technical. My husband asked me at the beginning if I was going to cover the Krebs cycle, and I promise you not to do that. All right, so why is research important to begin with? And this is not just for you to learn about. I think this is also important because it gives you the tools as you go speak to your legislators, as you promote awareness. These are tips and information that you can use to emphasize um, as you promote awareness about scleroderma. So research is important because research, if we do it well, and we have good luck with it, is what leads to discoveries. And it is these discoveries that lead to development of treatments or therapies. And ultimately, we just need one really good one, right? So as research moves along this way. And research is what allows the next phase of things to happen. So initially, the research, the discoveries happen at the bench in the academic labs. Ultimately, it leads to identifying candidates that could be developed for clinical trials and then are taken up by our partners, the pharmaceutical industry, to develop into a phase one trial and if proven safe, go to the phase two, phase three, and so on in order to develop therapies that are effective for scleroderma. So research is important because without it, we'd never get to the drugs, we'd never get to the clinical trials, and we'd never get to the cure. And research in scleroderma has involved different aspects of scleroderma. 
we know that scleroderma has different hallmarks. One of them is vascular abnormalities, typically, for example, Raynaud's, which most patients have. Um, there are immune system um, abnormalities or dysregulations. One example is that everybody has an autoantibody that's specific for scleroderma. Um, and there's also fibrosis, and fibrosis is the thickening of the skin and the internal organs um, that causes a lot of the problems that we run into. Um, research has focused on a lot of different organs, the lung, especially the lung, uh, focused on the skin, um, a lot of the key cells uh, the, that are called fibroblasts that are the ones responsible for making too much collagen and other what we call extracellular matrix molecules that deposit around the cells and thicken the tissues. Uh, there are epithelial cells that are studied, endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. So there are many players in scleroderma, and research over the past 25 years has focused on all of them. We have also focused on looking at genes. We're going to go over that a little bit, all in our quest to identify the cause and identify the cure. So I'm going to focus on one of these hallmarks initially, again, just to empower you with the knowledge that would give you the tools that you need moving forward. For example, fibrosis, which is the thickening of the skin, of the lungs, of the internal organs that causes these organs to not function properly. Why is it important? One, because fi we know fibrosis can affect nearly any organ in the body. We know that it causes a lot of problems, and you're going to see not just in scleroderma, but it's important for a lot of other diseases. And we still don't have any drugs that are approved that can either stop the fibrosis or reverse it. We have drugs that are approved that slow the progression, but that's not a cure yet. So we still have to do more work. And it has been estimated that fibrosis is responsible for nearly half of deaths in the developed world. Now, you may think that's not a realistic number. How could that be, half of deaths? That's because fibrosis affects all these conditions. So it's not just scleroderma, but if you look at individual organs, for example, the lung alone, you can have fibrosis of the airways if you have asthma. In the liver, you have fibrosis of the liver if you have cirrhosis, whether it's hepatitis-induced, alcohol-induced, in the heart, you can have fibrosis when you have a myocardial infarction. In the skin, obviously, the kidneys. If you have diabetes and diabetic nephropathy, you can have fibrosis of the kidneys. So why is research on scleroderma important? It's because scleroderma is the prototypic disease. If we solve the fibrosis puzzle in scleroderma, we will positively impact all these diseases, and there are dozens of them that have fibrosis in mostly one organ. So what have we learned over the past 25 years? Quite a bit, actually, because if you look at the publications over the past 25 years, we are currently at around 2,000 scientific publications per year. That's 2,000 novel discoveries a year, because you can only publish if you have something novel. That's quite a bit when you think about it. The amount of knowledge we're accruing every year by labs around the world doing research. And this is, the number of publications is mostly because the scleroderma community is very collaborative. So this is a network that shows investigators from across the world that are collaborating on projects, and this is specifically on the publications that I just showed you. The collaborators that are working together are working across many countries. You can look at a, this graph and see countries that you never knew had research on scleroderma. So it is through these collaborations and networks that we're advancing research at a faster pace than ever before. We've learned a lot. Uh, this is not showing up exactly the same, but that's okay. We're going to have some Mac to PC conversion glitches. But we've learned a lot over the past several years. Initial work from Dr. Thomas Metzger and Dr. Ginny Steen, who's right here, has taught us a lot about the natural history of scleroderma how diffuse systemic disease can be different from limited disease. When is progression happening? When is internal organ involvement likely to happen? Uh, what is the progression rate? So we've learned a lot about which interner, internal organs are involved, right? We know a lot now how to estimate what's gonna happen, assess risk. We've also learned that there are 
nine and autoantibodies that are specific to scleroderma. A lot of them um, described at the University of Pittsburgh. And through learning on these antibodies, we also learned that many of them are highly associated with specific internal organ involvement. So anti-centromere antibodies um, lend a higher risk for pulmonary arterial hypertension. SCL70 is a risk for interstitial lung disease. Um, RNA polymerase antibodies put you at risk for kidney issues. So we've learned a lot from studying large cohorts of patients what the antibodies are and what they mean, and they allow your rheumatologist to monitor your disease progression and your internal organ involvement. We also started understanding better that the disease is not the same in everyone, right? We're all different. We all have different journeys. We all have slightly different variations of the disease. And based on ethnicity, there can be differences unique to subpopulations as well. So now we know more what's happening in African Americans who have scleroderma and often more severe disease than um, non-African Americans. We've learned a lot more on pediatric scleroderma, which had been this black box. You know, they were, it's rare in kids. Scleroderma is rare and very little was, none, was done on it. We've learned a lot about pediatric scleroderma. We're gonna learn a ton more because the Childhood Arthritis Rheumatology Research Alliance has formed a scleroderma work group um, led in the US by Dr. Cassie Torek and Dr. Suzanne Lee who have been tremendous champions for pediatric scleroderma research and support. So we're learning a lot about how pediatric scleroderma differs from adult scleroderma, but also how it might be similar. So as we develop therapies, we can know what applies to pediatric cases and what doesn't. There's also, um, the work group has been putting out a lot of publications, as I mentioned, on differences, but also gender differences in kids with scleroderma. So we're learning a lot at a much faster pace on pediatric scleroderma as well. And now there's a Pediatric International Consortium for Scleroderma that includes 44 physicians from 18 countries that's enrolling 400 cases of juvenile scleroderma cases and is a project that is very proudly funded by the National Scleroderma Foundation. We've learned a lot about the key cells in scleroderma. We know that a fibroblast and other cell types can become activated to form what we call myofibroblasts, which are the active cells. They interact with other cell types to promote um, uh, the condition and the phenotype of scleroderma. This is sort of what we've learned over the years. I promise I will not go over this in detail. But I just want you to know how we've connected the dots and the cells and what affects what and how and what makes what and in what setting and how much of it does it make to understand what's really going on in the tissue. So it's a very, very complex picture. We've learned that in scleroderma and then, for example, in fibrosis in general, you can have factors that block fibrosis made in your body. You can have factors that promote fibrosis made in your body, and normally those balance out. But when you tip the balance in favor of the factors that cause fibrosis, then you can induce fibrosis. So our job now is to figure out how to tip the balance the other way to make sure we leverage the antifibrotic factors that our bodies can make but are not making enough of to heal the fibrosis. We've learned that scleroderma is a very complex disease because it affects different cell types, different tissues, different organs. It manifests very differently in every patient. So we've learned a lot about the, is there an inherited genetic background that makes us more prone to getting scleroderma, more susceptible? Are there acquired changes that happen through our life that make us more susceptible? What is the role of the environment? So I'm gonna go over those very briefly. And for those, let's just go over very, very, very basic biology. So if you all go back to what you learned in middle school and high school, we know that a protein, it, excuse me, is made from what we call messenger RNA, which is transcribed from our DNA. So our DNA is our genetic code. It makes a copy called messenger RNA, which gets translated into proteins. We're gonna talk initially about the DNA itself and what's been done in genetics of scleroderma. So you might have heard off and on the word SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms. 
our DNA is a double helix. We have two strands made of four letters, C, G, A, and T, in different combinations. That's how similar we all are. We only have four letters in our DNA. And if one letter changes, like the G that's in red font here, that's called a single nucleotide polymorphisms. These occur every about 1,000 bases. And we all have them. But we've identified more than 30 genes where these changes happen that seem to happen more often in scleroderma patients than in those who don't have scleroderma that suggest that scleroderma patients have these changes that might make them more susceptible to scleroderma. So we've learned that from the genetic studies. And why is that important? Because as we identify those little SNPs, that may tell us as we develop different therapies who might be responsive more so to one therapy than another. It's not gonna be one size fits all. And we're gonna to have to identify who may benefit more from therapy A and who may benefit more from therapy B. And knowing these DNA changes can help them. We did a study of twins many years ago to know if scleroderma is inherited. So if you have identical twins and they both get scleroderma, then you know it's likely inherited. And if one gets scleroderma and the other one is healthy, then you know it's likely not to be inherited. And what we found is scleroderma occurs in both twin pairs, so concordant in the twins, in only four to 5% of the cases. So that says that scleroder scleroderma is not a purely inherited disease, right? It's something that you have a genetic background that makes you more prone to, but something else happens in life that triggers it in each person. We also looked at concordance for ANA. So in the twins, how many have autoantibodies, antinuclear antibodies? And actually, it's very high. So you can see antibodies in first degree relatives of scleroderma patients, but you can see more and more and more of it as you go from first degree relatives to fraternal twins to identical twins. And it's in over 90% of identical twins. So that tells us that getting these antibodies might be an initial first step in people who are prone to scleroderma, but in the patients, it develops all the way to scleroderma. In the healthy twin, it stopped at the positive ANA and didn't develop further. So we need to understand why that is. So what that led us to formulate is a hypothesis that we think scleroderma and other autoimmune rheumatic diseases happen in people who have a genetic background that makes them prone to getting these conditions that maybe I get exposed to factor A and I get scleroderma. Maybe a cousin of mine gets exposed to factor B and they might get lupus or rheumatoid arthritis because we know that autoimmunity can occur in families. And that's what all these genetic studies and studies of twins have led us to understand that this is likely what's happening. So DNA is not everything. Um, over the past decade especially, there's been a lot of interest in what we call epigenetics and epi is on top of, so what's on top of the DNA, because there are things on top of the DNA now we know, and that's why there was an article in Time Magazine called Why Your DNA Is In Your Destiny. And basically, if you look at our chromosome and our DNA, our DNA gets modified. The, the, one of the bases, the cytosine in DNA, has a methyl group on it, gets methylated. Whether there's a methyl there or not tells you if a gene is turned on or turned off. That's the signal. So that's called an epigenetic change, right? It's on top of the DNA. Also, our DNA gets wrapped really tight around proteins, histones. So there are, the DNA undergoes a lot of changes beyond having its original sequence, and that's what a lot of the research has focused on. So this is an example of a, of a piece of DNA where you can see in the top one, I'm not sure if the if I do the laser, can you guys see it? Maybe not. Where you see the C, and then on the lower strand, you see the C has M on it for methylation. So that makes a difference between a gene being turned on and turned off. And now we know that this methylation is different for some genes in scleroderma patients from individuals who are healthy. Um, and that explains why some genes get turned on and turned off. So that's another advance that we've made in understanding what's happening to turn these genes on or off. We've also made a lot of progress in identifying biomarkers. There's a lot to be done, but biomarkers are proteins that can be measured in the blood. So 
investigators will draw your blood and they will measure level of this protein and they will see is this protein high maybe in patients who have lung disease maybe it's low in patients who don't have lung disease is it present only in scleroderma patients and not other individuals so the nice thing about the biomarkers is it just takes a blood sample so it's much more convenient it allows us to identify individuals at risk, and we're getting there. We're not quite all there yet, but the biomarkers are being developed in several labs. It allows you to predict and monitor the progression of scleroderma. As the levels of a certain protein go up, you know someone is going into a flare, and then you can address it before they go into the flare. And we can also use these biomarkers to determine who's responding to the treatment that was developed. So we have therapy A, who's responding to that and who's not responding. We've done a lot to understand how scleroderma compares to other diseases. So for example, we've done studies looking at thousands and thousands of genes in the lungs of patients with scleroderma and how they compare to patients with a related condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis but also how they relate, for example, to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. And we found that scleroderma has some shared features, genes that are turned on or turned off similarly in scleroderma and these related diseases, but also genes that are unique to scleroderma that we can study as well. And that helps us as we develop therapies to target, as I mentioned, not scleroderma only, but leverage what we learned from scleroderma to help those with all these other conditions. A major technical advance over the past few years that has allowed us to understand the thousands of genes turned on and off has been what's called single cell RNA sequencing. And that's been a technique that has allowed major advances because what it does is it takes tissues. So for example, if you have a skin biopsy done, the investigators can take the skin. They add the enzymes that break down the skin into single cells. So now you have a solution that has thousands of single cells. And what happens, you can look at every single gene in every single cell. So you end up with this massive amount of data of all the genes turned on and turned off in every single cell and cell type in that little skin punch biopsy. And that has really advanced and revolutionized research over the last several years because it has not only allowed us to know what, what exactly which cells are responsible for genes being turned on or turned off, we've actually identified new cell types that are in skin and lung that we had never heard about before. And as we identify those cell types, uh, we've been able to identify cell types that emerge in scleroderma skin that we don't see in normal skin, and cell types that are lost in scleroderma skin that we only find in normal skin. So that's been a tremendous resource, generating immense amounts of data that require a lot of analysis and computing power, but provide a wealth of knowledge. So really, it's all these advances in technologies over the years that are allowing us to move research at a faster pace than ever before. That's why I'm very optimistic because not only are we learning a lot, we now have technologies that we're using and technologies that are emerging soon that are gonna allow us to just accelerate the pace of research to a pace we had never had before, which allows us to get to the cure much faster than we could have done it before. So, as I mentioned, research is important because that's what leads you to the discoveries that lead you to the therapies. And most of us generate an idea or a target in the lab. We then test it on cells that we grow out of skin biopsies or lung tissue from patients who get a lung transplant from the discarded lung. And we grow those cells on, in plastic dishes in the lab and we give them nutrients to keep them alive and happy and vitamins and amino acids and everything else. But ultimately that doesn't reflect the human body, right? You're studying cells in isolation cultured in a dish. So we have to test at the next level, and most testing uses rodents, more commonly mice. But the problem is we're not mice. You know, mice have a metabolism that's way faster than human metabolism. Um, they have, there are genes that are found in humans that are not exactly the same in mice. For example, the enzyme collagenase, which breaks down collagen, which we need to remove all the collagen that's around is not the same gene, MMP1 is not the same gene in mice. So 
we're not mice. We're not going to behave like mice. And actually, most things that are tested in mice work fine. But then when they get to the human trials, they often fail. And that's the reason. So I can tell you for sure, I can cure just about anything in mice. It's very easy. But the key is not just curing in mice, it's curing in humans. So another advance, research advance, that has happened is to make sure that the drugs we are developing are relevant to the human disease and not just for mice. We've developed other ways of testing them over the last several years. For example, now we know we can take human skin, and that's what you see in these dishes. This is pieces of human skin um, from tummy tuck surgeries. We can take a human skin, and we can inject proteins that cause fibrosis in human skin and show we can cause the thickening. And we can inject things that are potential therapies and show we reduce the thickening. So why is that useful? Because we know beyond mice that this therapy is now likely to work in patients, in humans, because it worked in a human tissue in the lab. Research has moved forward also with engineering tissues. So we can get the skin from tummy tuck surgeries and test in that. But now we can also isolate cells, let's say from a skin biopsy, if we isolate different cell types, we can combine them in the lab together with some kind of a matrix or a scaffold or a gel to give them a 3D structure and make them seem like small organoids and then test in this setting as well when you have all the cell types together, is the therapy effective? So research advances involving developing these newer models that are more relevant to the human disease also ensure that we're not spinning our wheels testing things that only work in mice. Another emerging field is um, identifying what we call extracellular vesicles. These are tiny, tiny vesicles that bud off of cells. So this is what you're seeing as a cell. You're seeing the membrane all around like a circle, and you're seeing these little circles that bud off, form off the cells. We've learned these extracellular vesicles exist. We didn't know that before. We know they're made by the cells, they're shed by the cells, and they go communicate with other cells. They send signals to other cells in, in the same tissue and in other tissues. And what we've learned recently is that these vesicles contain factors that can trigger fibrosis. So a cell in a, in a part of the skin that has the fibrosis can shed these vesicles that then travel to nearby skin and tell the cells there to now start making more collagen. So now we're leveraging this information not only to determine what's inside these vesicles, but also to leverage them to our advantage, to engineer them and load them up with antifibrotic factors that then can go across the tissues and send the signal that we want them to send to the other tissues. There's been a lot of research on the microbiome. As you know, there are more bacterial, fungal organisms in your body than there are human cells in your body. And our microbiome changes a lot. It depends where you live, what kind of diet you eat, and a lot of other factors. And we've learned a lot about the microbiome in scleroderma. We've learned that the microbiome in scleroderma, and this is looking at the microbiome that's in the gut, is different in patients with scleroderma than healthy volunteers. We know that the change in the microbiome um, re is relevant for knowing disease duration. It's also relevant for knowing how much inflammation there is. The microbiome can tell you that. We also know that the microbiome is different in scleroderma patients, not just in one location, but in a study that was done in the US and Europe, that there are similarities of patients across countries, which is important because, as I said, the country you live in, the diet you have impacts your microbiome. So the fact that patients in different countries have a similar change in the microbiome is also informative. So studying the microbiome is another research advance that has happened mainly in the past decade that's gonna be, I think, very critical for us to understand how we can manipulate and change the microbiome to improve symptoms, improve maybe GI involvement, severity of GI involvement. 
there's been a lot of research on metabolism, and especially with fibrosis. And I'm not talking about your overall body metabolism. Each cell inside it has also metabolic pathways. There's metabolism happening inside each cell. One of them, for example, is the breakdown of glutamine. One of the most common amino acids in the body is broken down at a faster pace in the setting of fibrosis. So we've learned that there's changes in the cellular metabolism in the cells that are derived from patients with scleroderma compared to healthy volunteers. And we've learned also what chemicals out there or drugs alter that metabolism to be able to manipulate it. We've also learned that there are important changes in fatty acid oxidation in the cells of scleroderma patients. And again, understanding these pathways is not just for the sake of understanding them. Many of these pathways have been studied in other diseases, especially cancer. The cancer field is way ahead of ours. And the advantage of that is many of these drugs that we know can impact scleroderma have been approved for cancer. For example, we talked about epigenetics and the methylation that happens on the DNA where there are drugs that change methylation that have been FDA approved for use in different cancers. If we find that those could be leveraged for scleroderma, it's a much faster pathway to repurpose existing approved drugs for use in scleroderma. So that's the advantage of understanding these pathways at the cellular level. We've learned a lot from all the scleroderma clinical trials that have happened over the past 25 years, um, from the scleroderma lung trial, uh, lung study one, two, and three. But there's also been a whole slew of other trials that have led to drugs being tested, but have also led to the approval, for example, of nintetinib for scleroderma, to the approval of tocilizumab. And tocilizumab, for me, makes a difference in a way because when I started out doing research in scleroderma, I described the first um, evidence that cells from scleroderma patients make too much IL-6, interleukin-6, this inflammatory factor that is targeted now um, through the approved drug. So the trials are working. They are leading to some being approved. Many of the drugs that get tested are not going to work as well as anticipated and are not going to be approved. But there, there's still a lot of reason to be optimistic because currently in labs across the world, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of molecules, small molecules, um, engineered antibodies, peptides that are being developed for potentially the treatment of scleroderma that are going to make their way through the pipeline from the discoveries into the clinical trials. As I mentioned, one faster approach that we can tackle as we understand more and more what's happening in the cells and the tissues is to identify drugs that are already approved out there for other conditions, such as various cancers, and repurpose them for the treatment of scleroderma. That's another option as well. So as I mentioned, we've made a lot of advances in the research over the past 25 years. And I'm going to refer again to Dr. Steen, who's here, who's been a tremendous force in the scleroderma community, generating a lot of the initial data and information we needed, but also mentoring the next generation of rheumatologists that are now going to take us to the next level. But Dr. Steen and Dr. Metzger many years ago, for example, showed that renal crisis was no longer a cause of death in scleroderma because we had ACE inhibitors that could be used. And now lung disease is a more important cause of death in scleroderma patients. So a lot that has helped how we've sh shifted our focus to lung disease, right? Research over the past two decades has shifted as a result of that to say, okay, lung disease is now the main problem. We're going to tackle that. So those studies are critical for guiding the field as well. But through research over the years, we've learned a lot, right? Now we have a couple of drugs that are approved for lung fibrosis. We have a lot of drugs in use for pulmonary arterial hypertension, something that we didn't have 25 years ago. We have uh, drugs you can use for digital ulcers. Um, for GERD, there are a variety of things that can be used for GERD that we're fortunate to have because it's a miserable symptom to have. For gastroparesis, for Raynaud's, there are multiple things you can use for Raynaud's. We now know ACE inhibitors help with renal crisis, and obviously there are a variety 
of um, potential treatments for Sjogren's syndrome. I think those of you who went to the dentistry session probably heard about it, all of them as well. So the advances in research in the past 25 years have been effective when we think about it. All these symptoms and manifestations have something that can be taken for them that helps. It doesn't help it go away completely, but it certainly helps with the symptoms, helps reduce the progression, helps reduce the severity. So our task is now to take it to the next level and figure out not only how do we help it, how do we change it back to the way it was before scleroderma. So we talked about genetics, we talked about epigenetics, we talked about how biomarkers help us with things. We talked about these vesicles that communicate between cells. We talked about gene expression, the microbiome. How is that useful? So if you look at the top of the slide, you can see people, individuals, that are all in different colors. That's because we all have different journeys. We all have different manifestations of scleroderma. No two patients are exactly alike. No two patients have exactly the same course of the disease. But how can we leverage all this information that we've learned from research to understand how we are different, but also how each person can have the most effective treatment for their particular form or variant or subtype of scleroderma? So leveraging, combining all this information, when we learn, okay, what are your genetics? What single bases or SNPs are changed in your DNA? What are the epigenetic changes on your DNA? What are the biomarkers you have? Which ones are elevated? Which ones are reduced? When we gather all this information, what's your microbiome like, we can start sorting patients into sets that are more similar, cohorts, groups that are more similar. And maybe those, let's say, colored and light blue may respond to therapy A, those in yellow respond to therapy B, those in green respond to therapy C because it will not be, as I said, a one-size-fits-all treatment. We're gonna to have to look at individual patients, the features that I just talked about in each individual patient, so make sure we cater the treatment to be the most effective treatment for patients with those particular characteristics. And that's precision medicine, and that's the future of research, and that's the impact that research has on the treatment of not just scleroderma, but any disease, right? Is having that precision medicine, personalized medicine approach to make sure that every patient gets the appropriate therapy that's most likely to be effective for them. So what have we learned over the past 25 years? Again, I'd say an awful lot. And I'm gonna take you through the path. We've had a lot. The number of publications has steadily increased. Um, we've learned, starting from years ago, a lot of key features of scleroderma, and I don't know if you all can read it, I can't read it from here anymore, but um, we've learned early on from the 70s, the first observation that fibroblasts from scleroderma patients make too much collagen. That was a key observation that was made, right? That has led us to now use the increased collagen as a marker. Does something increase collagen or does something decrease collagen? That's how we sort of sort through things and measure the effectiveness or efficacy of a drug. We've learned through the trials about kidney disease. We've learned how to avoid people going into renal crisis. So we've made a tremendous number of advances over the years that have resulted in some, uh, in multiple clinical trials with some drugs being approved, but also some drugs being repurposed for scleroderma. And I'm gonna put this up briefly just so you all get a scope of the research and how it's impacted the field. And the technologies that we're now using and that are currently still emerging, when you think about it, we went from you know, single digit publications in the 40s and the 50s to 2,000 publications a year. And I think if it weren't for the pandemic and a lot of the labs being shut down for part of the pandemic, we would have been over 2,000 publications a year in 2022. So we've gone from a few scientific discoveries a year to thousands of them a year. But we've also gone from technologies where an assay that we do, let's say for collagen, would take a week to now an assay for collagen taking an hour. So not only has research advanced at an amazing pace, 
but I think the pace moving forward is going to be even faster just because we now have the technologies to look at thousands of genes at once. We can look with one assay at every single gene in the cell, so thousands of them simultaneously, which we couldn't do years ago. So I think it's a very hopeful time for research. It's a time to be optimistic. It's to a time where it's gonna be hard to keep up with the new discoveries because they're gonna be moving at such a fast pace, but it's also a very exciting time. So what does our future hold? Robert Goddard had said, it is difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And I honestly think that the reality of tomorrow is that we will have a cure. The cure can be tomorrow, identified in a, in a lab or in a, somewhere tomorrow. It's hard to know. We could wake up tomorrow and someone has made like the key observation that leads us to the treatment. It could be next month, it could be next year, but there is a cure on the horizon. And research is what's gonna get us there because as I mentioned, without the research in the academic labs, there is no treatment being developed because it is those discoveries at the bench that are leveraged for the development of treatments. But research is expensive and as Mary Woodard Lasker said, if you think research is expensive, try disease. It's expensive because we have to fund investigators and provide grants so they can do the research. They have no other way of doing the research. The universities historically don't provide the funds for the research. The investigators apply for grants. And the National Scleroderma Foundation has not only been a lifeline to the patients and the caregivers and the community, and truly the only organization that's out there for the scleroderma community, but it's also been the lifeline for the investigators, funding grants. And not only funding grants for investigators known in the scleroderma field, but also ensuring that the up and coming generation of young investigators has funding to take off and start with the new ideas they have and leverage those ideas to advance research in the field. So yes, research is expensive, but we're looking for the cure. How can you put a price on that? So, what is the path to the cure? The path to the cure is to supporting research, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, to make sure there is a next generation of investigators, physicians, and scientists who can pursue scleroderma research. And for that, the Scleroderma Foundation has an early career investigator workshop to mentor the next generation investigators, make sure they don't fall through the cracks, make sure they have the resources they need make sure they have the support they need, and to start even younger at the level of graduate students and give them fellowships to encourage them and entice them to stay in the scleroderma field. But we need everybody's engagement for research. Believe it or not, you all have a role to play. You all have a big role to play. We need donors to support the research. We need the investigators who do the research. We need the patients who participate in the research. And we need everybody to promote advocacy, to promote awareness of the research, to promote awareness of scleroderma. So you all have a role to play. For the research itself, the Scleroderma Foundation has funded a large number of grants over the years. The blue bars give you the number of grants that were funded each year, and the line tells you the amount of money that was given out by the foundation. In fact, nearly 300 grants have been funded by the Scleroderma Foundation since they started funding grants and over $33 million. That's a huge accomplishment. The National Scleroderma Foundation, by providing support for patients, caregivers, promoting awareness, education, supporting research, is pretty much doing it all for us. Imagine how much that is, to have all these resources built into a single organization where everybody operates like a family and everybody cares about what happens. The other thing we started that is new, and I don't know how many of you are aware of it, to ensure that there's more collaboration across the globe. The National Scleroderma Foundation started the Advances in Scleroderma Research Global Webinars. So these are webinars that are held quarterly. 
They are currently attended by over 300 investigators from more than 30 countries. So we are bringing the scleroderma scientific and clinical community together virtually, now that we learned that virtual setup works, to bring them together to share the most recent research, the most exciting research that's coming out and make sure that there's a community working together across the world to advance research at an even faster pace. And I have to admit that between the early career investigator workshop, the research program, the global webinars, um, the student fellowships, I have to acknowledge Shena Gianetta at the Scleroderma Foundation who has masterfully managed all these programs. So I realize that I'm in this awkward position where I stand be not only between you and lunch, I actually stand between you and going home too, which is not an enviable position to be in. So I, I will wrap it up. So John Richardson said, when it comes to the future, there are three kinds of people. Those who let it happen, those who make it happen, and those who wonder what happened. So I'm hoping that as you leave this energizing conference where you've been with your tribe, you have learned new tips, new information, you've made new friends, you know that the National Scleroderma Foundation is there for you for anything you need, and you know that research is advancing at a faster pace than ever, that you will be one of those individuals who make it happen. Advocate for our cause, speak up, you now have learned why research is important. You can take that to your legislators, participate in research, help us raise the funds that are needed to support research grants. Do your part. I want you to leave here being empowered. You are not just the patients. You can do all of this. All of this is within your control. So be inspired as you leave here today, as you leave after this weekend. Be inspired to support each other. Be inspired to contribute to research. Be inspired to advocate for scleroderma. Be inspired to be the force behind our foundation to move things forward. So for that, I hope to end it. And I've convinced you through everything I've described that finding a cure for scleroderma is definitely, definitely not a mission impossible. We will get there sooner rather than later. Thank you.